Polarization feels like either being too scared to say anything or being angry all the time. For me, polarization is a decrease in trust and respect for the other. Why would I want to work with someone who is on the opposite side of the political spectrum from me? I get deeply worried about polarization when I see people starting to neglect those very things that have kept them together for so long. What's it going to take to bring us together when it feels like so much is pulling us apart? Welcome to Breakthroughs, a podcast by Search for Common Ground, the world's largest peace-building organization. In this show, we reveal the secret to solving tough problems by building collaboration. I'm Lena Slackmulder, and for the last 30 years, I've been working on the front lines of violent conflict. I've seen enemies become allies and overcome their greatest challenges together. In this first season of Breakthroughs, we're biting off a big problem we see pretty much everywhere, polarization. So let's get going. You can only tend to consider a person who's different from you as an enemy if you don't trust that person, or you assume that that person will never be able to see things from your perspective. That's Laurent Cassindi, a specialist in peacebuilding programs at Search for Common Ground. Originally from the Democratic Republic of Congo, Laurent has spent the last 15 years trying to bridge divides in communities affected by conflict using programs such as dialogue, media, and community engagement. When we talk about polarization, is it more than just the fact that we're different and diverse? I don't think so. In most of our societies and communities, people living together, they have diverse identities. And there is a way they can live with that conflicting. But polarization is the level where people stop only seeing each other as different and start seeing each other as enemies. And how does it happen then that people stop seeing each other simply as different? and start seeing each other as enemies. There are three factors that can I think of. One of them can be the kind of narrative that people get at home in their families. We grew up in societies when, where sometimes when hearing our parents talking about some people who don't share our ethnic identity as not liking us or potentially being our enemies. I also can imagine situations where people have different religions and if they are told from their childhood that people who don't pray the way they pray are their enemies. So these are some of the contexts in which living together in different identities can become polarization. And I would add also rumors, manipulation, sometimes from political leaders. So how dangerous is this polarization? You know, when I listen to you, it sounds a little bit maybe like healthy competition or healthy tension, does polarization really lead to people killing each other? I would say yes. So I'm just trying to see situation of scarcity where people are competing around water or just land, and they see that the other side is the one preventing them access, the resource that they want. So they would move to imagine that if that other side disappear, they can finally get what they want. I would also see situations where people have been told that you're living in an unhappy situation because there are some people who share this specific identity who are preventing you to feel happy or to feel understood in your, in your community. So you can tend to pose some acts which will destroy those people because they represent the risks to your happiness, to your access to power. This is how I see polarization leading to violence. Sometimes when we talk about how to address or reduce polarization, I hear people use this word trust a lot. What's the connection between trust and polarization? Trust is important because you can only tend to consider a person who's different from you as an enemy if you don't trust that person. Firstly, you may not trust that you can even have a discussion with that person. You may think that you cannot agree on something with that person. So there is a lack of trust there. Or you assume that that person will never be able to see things from your perspective. 
you assume that that person will never be able to feel how you're suffering related to some specific point. Because of lacking that trust, you will tend to take distance from that person and to maintain yourself in that polarization, polarized relationship. I see trust and polarization like around the vicious circle where they nourish each other. Because we lack trust, then we tend to see others as enemies and to not take the step to talk to them or to create a relationship with them. And because of polarization, then people will increasingly not be trusting each other. And this is how they nourish each other. You're listening to Breakthroughs, a podcast about using collaboration to solve some of our toughest problems. Religious differences are commonly mentioned when we hear about polarization. So today I'm speaking with Fatima Madaki, my colleague from Search for Common Ground in Nigeria, who's been addressing polarization through a variety of programs over the last 10 years. Welcome, Fatima. Thank you, Lena. Nigeria's population is about evenly split between Muslims and Christians. And over the years, we've seen waves of violent conflict that from afar can appear to be in the name of religion. But Fatima, how do you see the connection between religion and polarization and if it's contributing to violence or not? It's true that we have a primarily Muslim North and a primarily Christian South, and it can be easy for people to just blame the violence that we've experienced over the years in my country on this divide. But actually, there are many different conflicts, like over access to natural resources like land, there's been ethnic divides, electoral and political tensions. And what we see happening is that people use religion as a way of mobilizing people to use or support violence across these divides. So, for instance, most of the farmers in Nigeria are Christians and most of the cattle herders are Muslims. So when there is a battle over access to grazing land, it's easy for this to be portrayed as a religious conflict when in actuality it's around a use of natural resource. So you're saying that it's not actually caused by the differences in religion, these kinds of conflicts. That's right. It's not. But religion is a really important part of Nigeria. In fact, it's 7% of Nigerians identify as people of faith. But actually, about 50% of people have low or no trust at all towards people of the other religion. And this is what people hold on to, to aggravate the polarization across religious lines. Let's also remember that we've also had a violent insurgency group in parts of the North who have put out very extreme Islamist viewpoints. And it's been too easy for people to characterize all Muslims as being supporters of that viewpoint. Because we knew the passion that Nigerians have for their faith. That's where we started, in fact. We knew that the holy sites like churches and mosques across Nigeria were important for people of all religions. So we introduced the Universal Code on the Protection of Holy Sites. This was a way of getting people to work together so that all religious sites would be honored and protected. Remember that these places of worship are often the targets of violence in the past. So people felt really strongly about this and felt that the other religious community was to blame. In the process of mapping and agreeing on recommendations for how to protect these holy sites, religious groups were also able to build trust with the people of the other faith and overcome their prejudice. And this trust led them to be able to collaborate and see how working with people from other faiths could also help them achieve their needs. But sometimes when we talk about addressing polarization related to religion, it seems like we have to work solely with religious leaders. Have you found this to be true? A lot can be done with religious actors, yes, but we also found that there were many other groups in the country that had a huge role to play in decreasing this polarization. Lawyers, for example, because it's split, not south. Sharia law is practiced in the north and communal law in the south. And there were huge problems about dealing with blasphemy and apostasy, which had led to lynchings and detention. By working with Christian and Muslim lawyers together, I've seen them work better as lawyers looking at the law rather than reverting to their own religious identities. 
What about working with young people? Have you found that they also have a role to play in addressing this religious polarization? Absolutely. We also ask ourselves who is left out. I mean, even the religious leaders always tell us that we need to carry the young along who could actually become champions if dared to try. So the answer was not just young people, but adolescent young girls who are seen actually by both religions as not always valued or who rarely speak up. Even though they are equally victims of violence, we often see people paying attention to boys and young men, fearing that they will turn to violence. But we often underestimate how influential young women can be. So what approach did you take to engage this audience of girls? We undertook several projects bringing together Christian and Muslim girls into camps where they stood together, learned new skills and built relationships. The whole idea is that when they begin to see each other as allies and not enemies, their voices united can have a really strong influence in their respective communities. We called the project Niger Girls. And what did you see came out of that approach? Each time we did this project, we could see very simple and powerful results. The trust grew. There was excitement in being able to finally meet the other. The young people overcame their stereotypes and they were ready to speak back into their communities. They were ready to step back into their communities with an ability to advocate for a different approach in dealing with the conflict and understanding people from the other faiths and other community. My last question is, what is one thing that you might offer to our listeners who are seeing polarization grow in their own communities along religious line? Maybe a mistake that you wouldn't want them to make or something to remember? I would say definitely don't assume that you understand the conflict. We are victims to stereotypes. So I've learned how important it is to take time to understand the conflict with the religious stakeholders themselves. Secondly, to be sure to involve women so that we can amplify moderate voices. These are, you know, often marginalized in these faith communities. So we have to pay particular attention in involving them or they will just be left out. I've been moved by the involvement of young adolescent girls, especially, and I would encourage people to not overlook that group when thinking about addressing religious polarization. And with this episode, we conclude the first season of Breakthroughs, a podcast by Search for Common Ground, the world's largest peace-building organization. Find out more at sfcg.org and follow us on Twitter at sfcg. Thanks for coming along and stay tuned for future seasons.